Nia K. Evans is the director of the Boston Dreamer Project, which is working to, to organize greater Boston area neighbors, workers, business owners, and investors to create a community controlled economy. Evans has an educational background in labor relations, education, leadership, and policy. Her work, I'm um, sorry, her advocacy work focuses on eliminating barriers between analysts and people with lived experiences, while also increasing acknowledgement of the diverse types of expertise in policy. Evans frames Brown v. Board of Education and its legacy as primarily an issue of resource deprivation rather than a purely social issue. This perspective informs her work in advocacy, organizing, pol and policy, and derives the mis mission of the Boston Eugene Project. The following text has been edited and convinced from an interview with Nia K. Evans. Bass. Uh, when I think about organizing, an important part is for like-minded people in the field of law and policy to think about what their role is in making some of the rules work in our favor. What's their role in setting up the parameters such that they are not as constraining as they are today? It's, an e it's easy to di dismiss some of these fields because they can be seen as established and within the system. But our lives, whether we like it or not, are not are constrained by the system we're operating. Some important work, not the only work, is to change that very context. For me, education is less about credentialing, formal education, skill building, or job seeking. It's more about its function as a sharper, as a shaper of worldviews and of what people see as possibilities for how they can move through the world, how they should move through the world, and how to be. Pass. A lot of educational history contains legal history because it is such fraught territory. When I think about why it is so contested, it makes sense. It makes sense if you understand the role of education as a shaper of people's worldviews, and if you think about the history in this country of the struggle for power. It makes sense that different parties would understand that part of their struggle for power is controlling the realm of education. For Black people and other people of color, the history is one of wanting to either disrupt the education we've tried to provide for ourselves, or lock us out of a process that's supposed to be universal. There's this misperception that the fight for integration was a purely social fight and not a material fight. It was largely a material fight. The context being we had schools, we had our own methods of providing education. There were various ways in which they were disrupted. We know that some schools didn't have heat when there needed to be heat and some schools couldn't be cooled. We know that there were shortages of books in some schools. Some schools were far away, so people had to travel far to get to them. This was a function of these communities being under-resourced. We would figure it out, but there's but then there's the added dimension of intentional disruption. Pass. You have this school that is far away, and now you're going to do something to endanger that school. Now you have to go even farther or there is no school for you because you're not going to do, you're not going to this white school. It's already been established that it's not for you. There's this intentional malicious robbing of opportunity for education. There's no illusion about what's driving this. The largest mo motivation behind integration was the question of how to get the resources you are owed from people who are maliciously, intentionally robbing you of resources. One thought is, if you are in their school because they're resourcing the whole school, you get those resources too. They certainly would not intentionally rob themselves of their resources. That would be crazy. That would be crazy. But we see that they figured out a way to do this. Pass. What I take from Brown is the question of strategy and tools to get us the resources we need to be healthy, functioning human beings. A lot of that has dropped out in the narrative of what the strategy was. Now, a lot of us think the strategy was to integrate for purely social reasons. That was never the case. That, that is all to provide the, back, the backdrop to say that we are talking about resources. Garrity looked for busing to do what it cannot do, and the fallout wasn't famous. A lot of school funding comes from property taxes. We know that we grew up in communities that were intentionally and maliciously 
disinvested from. So property based tax, property tax bases were different in different communities. We know that inequity is essentially baked in throughout the entire process. Pass. There would be one of two things to do. The, the thought process was that to equalize resources across neighborhoods, our neighbors, neighborhoods had to not be segregated. Then you have more equal income bases that are underlying neighborhoods. Then you're seeing equality in the resources that schools have across neighborhoods. That would be the ideal thing to do. Pass. The second thing, which doesn't get talked about as much, is that people could just not be racist, could not interfere in communities, and could not set about to disrupt our efforts to provide education for ourselves. I used the word malicious earlier on purpose because I think that this gets dropped out a lot. We sometimes talk about racism as if it's an accident. A lot of it is just, it just isn't. A lot of it is very intentional and it's not okay. And we should be clear that it's not okay. We should not be treating racism or racist people as benign, they're not. We know the narratives of black families moving into historically white communities and how they were terrorized in those instances. Such occurrences are a function of acculturation, not natural fact, the result of having been taught to regard others hatefully. It is not a natural state of being. We know this because these messages are ensconced in racist redlining laws. When we say that it's automatic, we are ignoring the history of how we got here. Pass. All right, thanks everyone who read. Nia, um, wanna pass to you first. Any initial reflections hearing your words read back to you two years later? Was there a little bit more? The chapter, yeah, there's three paragraphs. Excuse me? First, the chapter isn't over. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was reading ahead. My apologies. <laughs> One thing I'm pull, pulled from this history is that cleared eye strategy is super important, actually understanding our tools and what they are used for and becoming adept at those tools so that we use them when it makes sense to us to use them. This would be one way the Brown case cases have influenced my current work on the resource front, because again, for me, this ultimately goes back to our communities not being robbed of our resources. Thinking about the link between that and economic democracy, the key is to not have a middleman on the importance of economic democracy, with the work that we're doing with Ujima, we have our resources that we are making decisions about. We are not going through an intermediate intermediary. We're not asking anyone for permission. We are deciding amongst ourselves how we are going to use our resources. We understand that they are our resources and we expense and we're expensive about that. Our resources are my money I put into investment and also what the community I live in owes me. What the city I live in owes me, what the state I live in owes me, and what the country I live in owes me. And so I am entitled to this two decision-making power over all those resources, damn right. I think is one of the influences helping to create a mechanism where our communities are not disrupted and providing for, re for ourselves. So much of that was ultimately just about not being disrupted and trying to care for ourselves. Pass. That's it. Thanks everyone. I'll get used to the screen sharing thing again. I promise I'll be smoother next, next, next month. Um, thank you so much Maki for reading. Thank you everyone for reading. Um, uh, Donna, you unmuted, Donna and Nia initial reflections before we open it up to the group. And also please use the chat function to tap in any thoughts. I think I am mostly just thinking about, um, I'm, 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 I'm mostly thinking, I guess, less about the content and just thinking about the conversation and the intimacy of the conversation. Um, so just thinking of my word, um, you a lot, which is that kind of you, where um, if you are um, 
if you don't if you don't understand how someone can be um you know kind of in a in a storytelling uh uh frame um and and kind of passionate um then the then the eye slips into you so i was just noting just noticing that that's that's where i was uh in in that conversation um which is um which is which is interesting. I, I think it just speaks to it, it. It speaks to the you know the nature of the the team. Uh, I would say that was that was putting uh, together this this project uh, in terms of just being able to um, bring about bring about comfort and, and intimacy. So that that's I think the main thing that I was noticing um, at rereading. That's awesome. We thank you for that. We thank you. That's quite a compliment, um, Donna. Um, yeah, I love I love this this chapter. I love the framing because I feel like some you know again another generational issue is a you know I work a lot with white organizations trying to work on racism, and what I'm lately fi finding is that you know so many of the white people that were my age grew up with the misperception that desegregation was about the social and it never was that was never the root of most black people for going after desegregation and i love the way that nia frames it i i think it's so it it's such you know i think people you know pe people who have a certain level you know not even a level so have who are being educated about the system are more aware of that but I think that the the powers that be have a stake in making people think it's about, you know, we want to be together or something like, you know, we want you know, that that it's about, you know, just a simplistic social seg desegregation. And, you know, I, I think she just hit the nails on the head. And I think it's so much about everything that we're we're dealing with now. It's it's sort of like that place of embodying it. You know, it's like, it really is on a certain level about really, you know, politically thinking about, you know, what what impact do these decisions have on bodies? You know, so I, I think it's I think it's the right way to go. I was really excited to read that. Thank, thank you, Donna. <laughs> we both thank you. Um, and then Lise has their hand raised and I want to, oh, and then uh, Camilla and um, and Ash. Oh, and Sierra and Luna. Okay, okay, I see what's happening now. Um, and Louise, uh, I wanted to add really quickly just um, a fun fact about these drawings and about our editing process. Again, you know, in some cases we have like 30,000 words, 20,000 words to pare down to a thousand. It seemed insurmountable. We, um, uh, we, we used Martha Schnee's drawings that became more and more rich and more and more focused as we went on. Some of them are composite drawings. We would sit around them together as a group um, and go through the suite, of, uh, the suite of drawings produced after every conversation. Um, and uh, in the, it had helped us in the editing process because what we could not fit into the text limit, into the word limit, we would things that we that we felt still needed to be included um, would be included through Martha's drawings. So those of you who have the hard copy, I encourage you to have the hard copy. It's incredible, it's free and incredibly rare. Um, and, and if you have the PDF, look closely at the drawings because they're meant to complement the text and our methodology of editing um, and making sure that the language is cut down to a thousand words per chapter so that it's, uh, what is it, you, you, that, that we can handle it. Um, next, I see Lise, and then Camilla, and then Sierra and Luna, and then Louise. All right. Hey, y'all, so my screen's over here, <laughs> so don't mind me um, looking away, but I just have to say I really appreciated the storytelling as well of this chapter. Um, it, it's very, like, manifesto, but I like the switch also between the I and the we. Um, that alternating between it um, brings, like, that call to action and collectivity. Um, that I think you know is very much needed when we think about like accessing our resources and being empowered and having our agency. Um, so just lots of appreciation for this and just like the reading of it and the shift from academic language that's very non-personal. I think that's very like impactful. 
Thank you so much. And I, I want a, a quick shout out instead of text messaging him uh, to K. Anthony Jones, who helped us uh, understand more clearly um, what that what that means when we identify that in transcribing um, uh, or uh, recordings of oral history. Um, when we went on to our next project after this, the land claim, uh, we were we had to get clear about what it meant that people were speaking to us in eyes, the pronouns that people were using to describe their own experience and to invite others to consider seeing that experience for the first time. It's um, it's very tender. So um, thank you, uh, Camilla and Ash. What y'all what, what what's on your mind? Uh, I was just thinking, I was just appreciating sort of like the the intentionality of having us read Donna's chapter um, and then Nia's right after and like Donna talking about like systems and how systems can't be changed and they can be, they can't, they, they can be influenced. Um, and then Nia talking about sort of this collective power and this collective decision making that like affects, you know, our like funds, like what we're like putting into it. Um, and then like the material fight for resources. Like I've been thinking about this a lot um, as I've started teaching in Boston public schools, like after schools and like teaching in like predominantly Latinx schools and then some black schools. And like, just thinking about the way that teachers like allocate resources and like meet the needs of those students. And then like the bus shortage during the pandemic and shortly after, and like this idea of like a receivership and like the state just like making decisions for Boston public schools and like how, a lot of teachers are worried about the way that these material resources would be distributed in ways that like don't directly meet the needs of their students like you know like how they they get to know their communities they get to know their populations and like uh adjust to try and their best to meet their needs obviously teachers are like underfunded and underpaid and under resources like a lot of people are but anyways i guess i just wanted to appreciate uh like the conversation about systems and how it leads to like the actions we take now um pass did you have something uh, you yeah. guys can okay well <laughs> my thoughts were along like the last part of this has me really thinking about like in COVID one of the things that I had experienced was like mutual aid groups that were popping up on social media and like that um, you know especially in the early days of that pandemic when like you know the government was not really doing what it needed to do and there was a lot of misinformation a lot of things going out that um there were these cropping up of like community resources for people. There was Facebook groups where people could post their Venmo and say like, I'm $400 short on rent and people were contributing and, and sort of that we did create this structure to like support our own community without any oversight. You know, that I, you know, the part where it says like that you have to learn to hate other people is just sort of all like ringing uh, true for me. But that's like an interesting connection, I guess. Thank you, my dears. Shout out to any and all former Mass Art students I got to work with who came tonight, including Camilla and Ash and Haley. It's so great to be back together with you. Sierra and Luna, what's on your mind over there on the couch? Ah, hi. <laughs> uh, Keith's here too now, so we're all here listening. Um, I was thinking a lot about, um, you know, Nia's points. And it kind of brought up for me this idea, like I guess the live conversation and political project around uh, segregation, how, seg how segregation looks in schools now. Um, and I guess like how uneven development makes it so that schools end up being segregated, end up being um, defunded anyway, <laughs> um, because of property taxes and a lot of other stuff going on. Um, and a question that I have, I guess, for like the editing body um, was did that ever come up in any of the interviews or conversations, especially in Boston, where we do still have, you know, crosstown busing for students and all that other stuff? So I was just curious. Can you reframe the question so I can send it to Anthony or Kayla? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I guess I was just wondering. Um, so we still exist in a time where segregation in schools exists, especially in Boston. Um, and I was just wondering if that ever came up in any of the conversations or if y'all were just talking about specifically in terms of the Brown 2 case. Um, and if so, what that was, what that, those conversations were like. Okay, I guess I should answer that. Um, that fact uh, inspired this whole inquiry and inspired my first round of inquiry into Brown 1 when I went off to uh, study painting in New Haven for a couple of years where I met Malene. Um, using the the law school to um, law school archives where nobody else seemed to care about books about Brown or school, he said, because 
they were dusty and I didn't have to worry about keeping them for a whole year because nobody else was asking for them. But it all began here with this, this image uh, when Nia was uh, working with the uh, Boston branch of the NAACP as coach vice chair of the education committee and chair of economic development committee. Here's Nia, little, little young Nia. And back there is a little young Donna Bivens in the gallery in Boston City Hall where there were hearings happening um, uh, as Nia was, Nia and others were working together in coalition to in an attempt to save what remained of yellow school bus service for Boston public school students. Um, in her capacity as a as a as a as a member of the as a as a what is a working member of the NAACP Boston branch, um, she and others became aware of um, of of coming legislation that would that would gut what remained of yellow school bus service, just about two months before the school year was going to start. Um, with most families being unaware that it was happening. Um, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice was a part of that coalition. Um, there's another acronym, help me Nia, the acronym for Black, Be Black Teachers. Being uh, Black Educators Alliance of Massachusetts. Yeah, and um, this, this uh, so Nia was dragging me around with her at the time to, uh, to, to video record um, to take pictures and to help her uh, talk with people on Boston Common and at bus stops and at train stations to let as many people we could, we could let as many people know as we could that this change was coming and to ask them if they knew. Um, so this is an image from uh, a hearing in which Nia testified and Deb Azrael uh, of the Harvard Youth Violence Project was testifying that there had been no recent studies on the experience of violence of Boston public school students getting to and from school since 2008. So there was all this language being used saying, you know, to justify uh, eliminating school bus service for middle school students and special needs students. Uh, but, the, but the city had some like crazy, crazy fiscal windfall that year, which Councilor Yancey laid out with many boards <laughs> and many like, uh, you know, like it was very visual. His presentations were very visual. He's like, no, there's actually a lot of money. There's no reason to do this. Um, and, uh, and there was also a lot of language that suggested that kids would be just fine because the adults in the room took the tea to and from, to and, to and from work and they didn't have any problems. But homeless youth, queer youth, black and brown youth that we spoke to on Boston Common told us about being um, harassed uh, by, by, um, by, uh, by, by um, uh, tea police. And uh, and uh, and by just just harassed, attacked, beaten, chased, um, trying to get to and from school. We heard stories from people who talked about dropping out of school so that they could so that they could escort their own little brothers and sisters to and from school because they themselves had been sexually assaulted and what, what weren't going to allow that to happen to their younger sibling. Um, and to me, it was um, horrific um, that these stories that people were telling about getting to and from school uh, sounded like it was from another era. I didn't understand how metropolitan uh, uh, members of, of society in Boston uh, were traveling uh, two hours. You know, without bus service, people were getting ready to travel to take two trains and a bus uh, daylight during daylight savings time in the dark. Children were supposed to be doing this to get to school with no um, with no softness on delinquents, uh, um, punitive responses, no extra bus cars, no extra no extra train cars no extra training for uh for transit police none of that it, it was it was insane to me and mia helped me understand that what we were seeing was a was a was a continued coordinated effort to roll back all gains made by great society legislation which includes brown v board of education one and two that's what we were seeing <laughs>